You know those songs that when you hear them, they take you back to times in your life when a song like that kept you standing and kept you going. Although I will say, right before the sermon, crying is not so good. (laughs) Thank you all so much. A decade ago, there was a series on Fox that I absolutely loved. So with my husband away this weekend, it was the perfect time to binge watch it once again, this time, of course, on Amazon Prime, and I had to pay for it. The show, sadly, only lasted one season, but it was just as good as I remembered. There were, though, parts I had forgotten. And at times, even 10 years later, it was so painfully real that it was hard to watch. And yet, this is Hollywood, and that show was a comedy. But it was also a playbook on how not to live your life. The main character, Keegan Dean, was a criminal defense attorney. Keegan was described as many things most were far from flattering. His ex-wife called him unreliable. To his fellow lawyers, he was an obstruction. Judges thought he was an outrage. The IRS called him a defendant. His bookie said he was a pain in the ass. And to his former drug dealer, he was simply a lost cause. The character of Keegan Dean was brilliant. He was frustratingly charming, and he was an example of a life of addiction. Apparently, the only time he ever tried a 12-step program, he went to the meeting to impress a woman he wanted to date, not because he realized that his life was out of control. When we look at characters like Keegan Dean in plays, TV series, or movies, we think we know what addiction is all about. And it is always all about other people and never us. If we were writing that script, we would have someone suggest to that character they should try getting into a 12-step program because their life is so messed up. We, who have our lives totally under control, are always eager and ready to offer advice to those who do not. Many years ago, as some of you know, I was fortunate to find my way into the rooms of 12-step programs. It was a time when circumstances conspired to make me realize I was not in control of the world, and I most certainly was not in control of my children's lives. I was on the staff of a very large church at that time, and I went in those rooms believing I had a great deal of wisdom about life. I remember sitting in the circle for the first time, looking at those people who were there and feeling genuinely sorry for them because it was so obvious they desperately needed help. Fortunately, I kept my mouth shut, meeting after meeting, until I realized I was not the one who was wise. In fact, my perfect little life was really a giant mess. By simply listening, I came to learn there was great wisdom in those rooms And it was found in those messed up people who were earnestly walking the 12 steps. And thankfully, they so graciously shared that wisdom with me by simply telling their own stories. During my times in those rooms in that season of my life, I learned so much from their stories, each of them having a unique and valuable understanding of what it means to work these steps. Rabbi Rami Shapiro talks about these stories as revelation. 
revelation that comes from recovering addicts of all shapes and sizes and addictions who have quit playing God, at least for today. Shapiro reminds us that these stories of people, these are stories of people who have experienced hitting rock bottom, people who have had the illusion of control stripped from them, and people who have taken the heroic step of daring to live without it. Last week, Reverend Michael opened this series by speaking about the first step, the step which Shapiro has called the gift of powerlessness. We all feel powerless a great deal over what happens in our lives. The 12 steps help us to admit that powerlessness, as well as how to take an inventory of ourselves, how to admit the exact nature of our wrongs, how to be honest with ourselves and others, how to be of service to others, how to be a messenger of hope. These are life lessons that pertain to all of us. These are messages and lessons that need to be carried beyond the recovery community to become part of our entire culture. One of the gifts we receive through the example of members of the recovery community is how to accept and acknowledge personal responsibility, which is in such short supply in our world. Listening to the wisdom of their stories can teach us a great deal about what it means to be a human being. The first three steps of the program help us reclaim our humanity. These are not easy steps because making an effort to entrust our will, our life, to an oft times invisible, at least to us, ultimate source or higher power or God is a stretch for many of us. Even those of us who find our way into communities like this. It is a stretch, especially if we have been repeatedly betrayed, abandoned, manipulated, physically or emotionally battered. If any of those things have ever been true in our lives, then entrusting our will, our lives, is at the very least way outside our comfort zones. Yet we can learn we are not alone in feeling this way. Whether we live near or far away, there are 12 step groups that meet every day of the week across the world. And in this community, there are many people who are willing to share their stories to help us find our way. Another of the gifts we receive through, is through the example of members in the recovery community. And that gift comes from listening. Their stories have much to teach those of us who have not yet found our way to those rooms. Throughout his life, Jesus constantly told stories and listened to stories of people's lives. Our reading from the Gospel of John this morning shows us one scene from the journey of Jesus, a scene in which he encountered a woman by a well in a place called Samaria. In the time of Jesus, Samaria was not a place where people from the tradition and religion of Jesus would have gone. In fact, they would have gone far out of their way and traveled many miles to avoid being in that place. Jesus, though, traveled right through there and on one particular day began a conversation with a woman he did not know. The woman at the well could have been any woman. She was a woman whose life path was marked with sadness. She came to the well alone and not at the time of day that most of the women from her village came to draw water. She came to the well alone because the circumstances of her life had made her an outcast in her own hometown. I wonder if on that morning, 
this unnamed woman at this well could have imagined that on this particular day, her life would change dramatically. This daily water gathering was undoubtedly part of the routine of her life, and yet on this day, something happened because someone reached out and brought a possibility of the unimaginable hope of restoration to her life. This woman did not simply turn on a switch and suddenly believe. Instead, she took a leap into the process of coming to believe. And that leap created a moment absolutely filled with grace. Shapiro says when we come to believe, we discover that the current reality of our life allows for nothing less. And when the current reality of our life allows for nothing less, we are in a place where we can fathom, perhaps for the very first time, what it would mean to decide to turn our life over to that reality, which is beyond ourselves. It is a reality that is always and forever waiting for us with water for our thirsty souls. Today, when we come to this table that has been set for each one of us, we do so whether we have come to believe yet or not. Because this table is not reserved only for a chosen few. It is a table that always and forever offers the hope of restoration and freedom for all of us. Today it is so, and we pray that it ever will be. Amen.